Well, Joshua chapter 3 and 4 this morning, it is Memorial Day weekend, and so I must admit I, I followed suit in my sermons today. And Joshua chapter 4 speaks of a memorial. I'm not gonna I'm gonna speak on Joshua 4 tonight. But there's a memorial in, in Joshua chapter 4 of 12 stones that God said, I want you to set this up so people remember what I did. It's only fitting that if we're going to look at the memorial tonight, that we look at what God wants us or wanted them to remember in the morning. And that's Joshua chapter number 3. In Joshua chapter number 3, we come to an interesting place in the Israelites' history. They've now left Egypt and they've been delivered from slavery where they'd been over 400 years. They, they traveled through across the Red Sea and traveled through the desert and they came the first time to a place called Kadesh Barnea. It was a Kadesh Barnea that there were 12 spies sent to spy out the promised land, the land of Canaan. They came back, and you, most of you know the story, 10 of the spies came back and said, there is no way that we can possibly win. And two, two men by the name of Caleb and Joshua said, are you kidding? We've already won. God has promised us the victory. Well, the 10 had such an influence on the entire congregation of the children of Israel, and by some estimates it was 600,000 men and another maybe two or three per family, so you'd have upwards of one to three million people out there. Such an influence that when they voted, everyone 20 years of age and old voted, they voted not to go into the promised land. Moses said this is a mistake. God said this is a mistake. And because of that, they were made to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, God was still with them during that time. He let their shoes not fail and their clothes not wear out. He brought them water and food. But, but because of their decision back here, they had consequences for 40 years. During that 40 years, they, they wandered through some different countries, different places. Then we come to, to Joshua Book of Joshua now, uh, Moses has passed off the scene, and, and Joshua now is going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. The 40 years has passed, and now they have to go, but they have a little situation. I'm going to say it this way today, they had a water problem. They had a water problem. I can relate to that today. This weekend, I had a water problem. We were hit with six inches of rain in two hours on a Friday night. How many of you had a water problem? Anybody use a boat, kayak, aircraft carrier? Woke up Saturday morning and I'd heard the thunder and lightning during the night and I thought that was a little weird. I woke up. I usually don't wake up, but boy, and I saw my phone flood warning. I go, well, that's weird. I feel like it only rained like an hour or two. Look in the backyard and my pond is huge. Look in the front yard in the house, I, I hear a sound. Now, men, you do this, and, and ladies, probably not as much, but men, do, do you know the sounds in your house pretty well? All right, I came in, I heard this sound. That's either wonderful white noise, being invaded by aliens, or I have a water problem. Went down to the basement, and, and sure enough, there's a water problem down there. The, the tube where the sump pump came out um, separated from the, the, the backflow, the stop valve right there. And so now my sump pump had been running since the power came back on and pumping all the water outside, inside. Who knew? Some pumps supposed to, supposed to pump the other way, but they'll pump either way. Had a little water problem. But nothing compared to what the Israelites faced. They had to go over there. There was a promised land. There was Jericho. There was a land that God said you have to go to. There was a land that they're supposed to go to 40 years earlier. There was a land that God said, you're going to go there. I'll fight the battles for you. But in between there and here was a river. Let's look in Joshua chapter 3, if you would. We'll read the whole chapter this morning. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. 
for ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I, that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribe of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord. The Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you still are the God that works. Lord, I'd ask this morning you would work here. Lord, guide me as I speak. Help me to say those things that would be helpful and true to your word. Lord, guide to the people as they listen. Would you touch our hearts? May we change towards you, through your word, to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The children of Israel had a water problem. They knew what God had said, and and between them and where they were supposed to go, there was an amount of water, as the scripture says, that Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the harvest time. It was not a small water problem. It was a large water problem. It was not a water problem that they could swim across or even walk across or navigate across. It was a water problem that was, in their eyes, insurmountable. And in this chapter, I first of all see the miracle that God did. I see a miracle that God did. He did something that would knock the socks of everyone else that knew about it. Knock the socks off. You'll notice that if you caught this, that they came right against Jericho. I think it's verse number 16 in the scriptures. When they ended up, they ended up real close to Jericho. Now, if you remember, when they came back, all right, after wandering 40 years, they came back to spy out the land, and this time, Joshua sent a couple of spies, two spies over. It was these two spies that when they got to Jericho, they met this lady named Rahab. Rahab was the one that said, we have heard about your God and what he does and what he can do, and we are scared silly. I loosely paraphrased what he said, or what she said. She let them down outside the wall. They came back, and, and if you were to look in verse of chapter number 2, you would see a different report. Remember the first time that the 12 spies came back, 10 had a negative report and 2 had a positive report. This time, both came back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and they said, listen, God is with us. What are we waiting on? Let's go. God is with us. When they ended up past this miracle over, over the Jordan, they ended up right by Jericho. So think with me, if you're in Jericho and you're already afraid of this group of people, a large group, of upwards of over a million people, you're afraid of their, their deity and what he can do, and you know that Jordan is between you and them, and all of a sudden it's not, what do you think? Uh, last time I checked, that Jordan was full. It ain't full right now. Are they walking on water? No, that's New Testament. And God does something that absolutely cements their mind and their hearts of not only his people, 
that he is the God. You need to catch this in the chapter three times over all the earth. He's not just your God. He's not just my God. He is the Lord. He is the God over all of the earth. Whether we acknowledge it, deny it, or accept it, it does not take away from the fact that he still is God. He's our God. See, a miracle, a saving act. I, I see, first of all, a statute, a command. The people come, the officers come, and they say to the children of Israel, uh, uh, we, we need to, for you to do a few things. The first thing you need to do is, is to wait. Now, last night when I got into that water, as a man, and men and women both, we have a problem. It is not natural to wait. It's natural to act, maybe scream, cry, hit your head against the wall, hit something else, but not to, to, to wait. And yet, they come here, and the first thing they say to do is, we want you to wait, to delay. We want you not just to wait for no reason. You're going to wait for the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to wait for the Ark of the Covenant. You see, this was a spiritual problem that needed a spiritual solution. Understand something that in our life, there are sometimes, there are physical problems, and there are sometimes that God sends a spiritual problem along that may look like a physical problem. This water was a physical problem, but it needed a spiritual solution. Joshua did not send the army of engineer, or the engineer corps to go build a bridge. He did not send the navy to build a boat to get across the river. He said, you know, wait for God and the Ark of the Covenant. Throughout Scripture, we have different times that God asks for both ways in our homes, in our, in our lives, in our church. We need the Lord's guidance to solve problems. And sometimes he asks us to do something, like pick up the manna from the ground. And other times he says, wait, I say, wait on the Lord. And we need his guidance to know which time it is. I don't want to sit back when God needs me to do, wants me to do something, nor do I want to rush in when it's God's turn to do something. And at this point, they said to the children of Israel, you're supposed to wait right now and wait for the ark to move. And they waited three days. Three days. Significant? Perhaps. Random? God doesn't do very many random things, does he? God doesn't make any mistakes. They waited three days. Psalm 48 says, for this, is our, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. You see, not only was there a delay there, there was a direction. There was a direction. They said to do this, follow the ark. Now this was interesting because up until this point, the children of Israel never followed the ark before. They followed, if you remember, a pillar of fire or a cloud. That was how God led them in the wilderness. Follow this. It, when the cloud moves, you move. When the, when the uh, fire moves, you move. The pillar of fire or the cloud. But at this point, they changed something. Before this point, the ark was always in the middle of the congregation of Israel. It was always back here in the middle of, of all the tribes. And as they moved, it would be here almost protected by everybody. The ark always signifies the presence of God. And at this time... God gave instructions to, to Joshua and through the men there, follow my presence. Follow this. Stop following the pillar. Follow this right here. Follow the ark. They said put a space in there of about 2,000 cubits, about 1,000 yards, about three-quarters of a mile. Put a space in there so that everyone can see where it's going, so everyone can understand what's happening. We're not just each going to follow the leader. We're going to follow the leader. We're each going to follow one in front of us. We're going to follow the master of the universe. And so the ark was, was sent there, and I'm so glad that we can follow Jesus Christ today. They, they, make this, or they say this phrase to them in verse number 4. He says, follow the ark because ye, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. Can I submit something? That that same phrase is great for you and I. We've not passed this way before. Today, no, we don't know what today brings or what a day holds. We've not passed this way before, but I know who holds tomorrow. I know who's in the future, and, and as the song says, I know who holds my hand. We've not passed this way before. You may be facing a crisis that you've not passed this way before, but Jesus, he's passed that way. He can guide you. He can lead you. 
You've not passed this Jordan River before, but, but someone has made the river, and, and it's not a problem to this one, so follow him. You've not passed this way before, and there's going to be times in our life, and we need them every single day, that we've not passed this way before. The doctor calls and said, you have this. You've not passed this way. This problem comes, you've not passed this way. But God wants to guide us through. God wants to lead us to something great inside of his plan. He said, follow me. Follow the ark. Did he tell them what they were going to do? No, he just said, follow at this point. Now, if you think back with me, when they got cut off by the Red Sea, Moses was there that day, and over the course of the night, God moved all the waters. Because they'd wandered 40 years, only two people had crossed the Red Sea, Joshua and Caleb. No one else, no one else at this point alive with the children of Israel had been through that previous miracle. I'm sure they'd heard about it. Listen, if you walked across, if you walked across the Cass River on dry ground, you'd tell someone else about it. Especially if God separated Lake Michigan for you to walk across, you'd tell people, you'd tell your kids and your grandkids, they'd heard about it. They'd never seen it. Isn't it true sometimes, young people, that you hear about the God of your parents? Of what God can do, but you know something? God wants to do something great for you. He wants to do something great for you. A week and a half ago or so, my son Johnny, 10 years old, came to me and a little bit discouraged. He was praying for something and, and it hadn't quite happened yet. One thing I've challenged us to as a congregation and myself as well, there are some things that only I pray for. Now, I'll give you some prayer requests on the way, hey, can you, and I have no problem with all of us praying because I believe we can approach the throne of grace boldly, but sometimes I pray for something all by myself because I want to know, I want in my heart to be confirmed that God hears J.D. Howell. I'm so glad he hears you, but I want to know, I need to know that he hears me. So that night we're sitting there in the school office, and I said, Johnny, I said, I want you to pray for this right here. What are you going to pray for? He said, well, Dad, I, I, I'm praying for this right here. And it was a want, not a need. We all have wants, don't we? If we're honest, come on, adults, we all have wants. Things we want, sometimes really badly. It's a little want. And you know, as adults, we're like, well, it's a want, not a need, so God will probably say no. Right? Because God doesn't really love us that much to give us our wants. He promises to supply our needs, but our wants we must bear with. Use some good King James word in there. Well, I said, Johnny, I said, you know, this is obviously a want. I said, we're going to pray that, that God answers it. But I said, we'll also pray that if he doesn't, he knows better. I said, I said Johnny, I said, you're, you know, you're, you're 10, and sometimes mommy and daddy say no when you want sugar at 1030 at night. I said, why do we say no sometimes? Well, he said, I wouldn't go to sleep, and he got a big smile on his face. I said, so we're going to pray, Lord, if this isn't good, then change my want, but I'm praying for you to do this. And I said, don't tell mommy about it, besides you're praying. I don't want her to pray for it. I said, I'm not going to pray for it. You're going to pray. Because I want you to see if God works. <sighs> that was me. Because I walk away saying, God, can you answer this prayer request for my son so he sees you work? Lord, can you, can you encourage his heart so that he knows that you're a God that cares about him, this little thing? I could have solved it in three seconds. You know, parents, we can solve that, but I, I didn't want to. I walked off and I prayed. Next morning, I talked to him, I said, Johnny, I said, you praying? Yeah, yeah. I said, Johnny, you think God can do it? I love kids because they're honest. He's like, yes. <laughs> Come on, adults, that's what we feel sometimes, is it not? Can God, can, can God do that? Yes. I have so much faith. I can almost fill a thimble full if I had it all together. So keep on praying. The neat thing was about a week later, God answered that request. He came running to me he said, Daddy, 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 God did this. Just what I pray for. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> really, because I want his heart encouraged. God wants to lead you something great inside of his plan. 
we're tempted to look at the situation and see the water problem and say, okay, I'm going to follow you, God, but it doesn't look really good. But understand something, if that Ark of the Covenant had sunk in the Jordan River, it was going to be down to the bottom, all the children of Israel would as well. But God outlifts himself. Not only do I see a statute, but I see a seriousness. I see a seriousness. In verse number 5, Joshua says this unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He's had to wait, and before God worked, Joshua said this, Tomorrow, God's going to do something, but you've got to be ready for it. You've got to be ready for God to work. Sanctify yourself, set apart, get ready, be purified, purification. Thankfully, God uses broken people. There's this idea out there that, hey, God will answer my request as long as I'm doing everything that he wants me to do, and we ought to please the Lord. But sometimes I've ran into Christians and, and it's like, have you prayed about this? Well, no, because I haven't been real faithful in my Bible reading. And we think somehow in our mind that if I read my Bible every day, now God hears me more. Now, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But I don't, I don't gain a greater entrance to God if I do all these things. I can boldly approach God and God will answer my prayers, but I try to please the Lord because I love the Lord. But, but Joshua says, get ready. And if there are things in your life you got to fix, then get them right. Get them right. I'm amazed how easily and how quickly that we can justify our wrong actions. Make a bargain with God. He says, be ready. Tomorrow's going to happen. Sanctify yourselves. Thankfully, God uses broken people. If he didn't use broken people, he would not use you or me. There's an expectation. Tomorrow the Lord will. Get ready and stay ready. This is what this verse says. Tomorrow, God will do this. When is it coming? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. An anticipation. A wonder what God will do. Remember, a few years back, we took our kids on an airplane. They'd never flown on an airplane before that they could remember. Talk about anticipation. Some of you don't like to fly. I happen to enjoy flying. Being in a pressurized cabin, squished next to someone next to you for three hours is wonderful. Who would not love this? But isn't it amazing how this hunk of metal strapped to two jet engines or three jet engines filled with explosive, explosive fuel and pretzels gets off the ground. My favorite part of flying is to take off. I love the feeling of that jet takes off and that, the thump in your chest. And it, it's my every time. I'll, I'll put on noise canceling headphones. But when it comes to takeoff time, I love that part. Throw me back in my seat, get me off the ground. It's so cool. And these kids, they're excited. The windows are open. They're like first time flyers. They weren't scared like some of you first time flyers, but they're looking out the window. Man, and, and as you look up, like, wow, we're so high up here. It's a cool thing to fly. But you had to get ready for it. You had to take some things with you to fly. They, they want things like identification to fly. You should take clothes with you when you fly, can't take knives with you when you fly. Found that out a couple trips back. Went through security and, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, there's something in here. Okay. I had a little pocket knife that I could not find. And they found it for me. <laughs> TSA is a wonderful organization. Of those kids' excitement. Joshua and Caleb, they'd flown before. They'd been on dry land before. They'd flown before, but no one else had flown before. They said, get ready, get ready, because tomorrow you're going to fly. Tomorrow God's going to do something. There's anticipation. I wonder if there was a buzz in the camp. Tomorrow God's going to work. Tomorrow he's doing something. Not two days from now, not even today, but tomorrow. Get ready, tomorrow it's going to happen. Tomorrow we leave, tomorrow we're taking off. And I bet Joshua and Caleb, when that happened, were just as excited. Oh yeah, crossing the river again. This is an old trick. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? And God wants to do the same in your life and in my life. Amen. You may have a water problem. I did. Thankfully, the sump pump solved my water problem. But I'm so glad that for my water problems in life, 
I have a God of the universe, a God who's over all the earth, and he wants to solve 